folks okay. i think i'm going to start if um since it's 206 so we have enough time for discussion and uh, conversation okay folks um that is official start i'm going to share my screen in a second i just wanted to introduce our esteemed speaker and we're very excited to have sarah gibson join us um she is a senior scientist and she was also an interim director that i need to ask you again on the H H um, A O in Boulder. Um, she's also the project scientist of the Punch Small Explorer mission. Um, she got her bachelor from Stanford and then um, her, she got her master and PhD from University of Colorado. Uh, she is very, very well known for CMEs in solar um, physics. She was a recipient of the Solar Physics um, Karen Harvey Prize. Uh, that's a big honor. And she's also a fellow of the AGU, and um, she's uh, part of many studies on the National Academy Space Studies Board, and she was also co-chair of the Committee of Solar and Space Physics, um, and finally also president of the AAU, Division E, that reached out between our community and the, the um, astronomy community. So we're very excited to have uh, Sarah tell us about her trajectory, and I'm going to share my screen because usually in those webinars what we do we just um, tell new people that are not uh, familiar with what this series is about um, what shield is about shield is one of the drive centers that was funded last year for phase two um, under the um, uh, smd division in nasa um, is one of the three drive centers um, aim to tackle a uh, breakthrough problems that need a center effort. And I am the director um, and John Richardson in MIT is my project manager. And, um, and we always like to start just to put in context what SHIELD is dealing with. We are dealing and trying to understand the heliosphere you're all familiar. What is a heliosphere? This is not a audience that I have to explain. What is heliosphere? Is is one type of an astrosphere, the bubble formed by the stellar winds as they move through the interstellar medium. And of course, um, so far we are the only planet that has life that we know of. So, um, and it probably has to do with the characteristics of the astrosphere that surround us. So we have an, an amazing opportunity to try to understand what is an habitable astrosphere look like and what properties it has that allowed life to develop. So we are um, starting this journey um, on, on understanding the characteristics of the heliosphere. We produce this movie that show um, where the heliosphere is today. Here is the planet Earth, all the other planets, and the heliosphere shown here in this surface is um, much larger than all our planets and engulf us. It has a size of around 200 astronomical unit, the distance to the sun, and it protects us from radiation and from dust that come from the galaxy. So it's, a, it's what I like to think it's our home in the galaxy. Um, SHIELD stand for solar wind and hydrogen ion charge exchange and large scale dynamics. You can blame my students for coming up with this acronym. Um, and the vision is that there are lots of puzzles um, that we gather in the last decade with the Voyager spacecraft, with IBEX, with Cassini, with IMAP that change our view of the heliosphere and brought um, in focus um, several problems that need a center effort to try to solve it. So the vision of SHIELD is at the end of the five years to make enough progress that we can have a pre predictable models. Or in another way, we can create a digital twin to be able to predict um, how its effect um, and protect astronauts when they go in long voyage the number one radiation is a radiation filtered by the heliosphere that is a galactic cosmic race. So it will have, I think the results of SHIELD will have implication for um, astronauts going in long-term voyage 
and for development in life in other styles as well. So it has implication not just in space physics, but in other disciplines as well. And here I'm showing um, the several institutions that are involved in SHIELD, mostly is housed in US, but we do have a very important international collaborators in Greece and in Moscow, um, and also in the University of Bern. Um, but here are some of the institutions in US involved. If you want to check, go to uh, shielddrivecenter.com. You will see all the activities. And here it's a picture of our kickoff um, showing um, um, the, the team as it is a pretty large team. Um, it, the shield is uh, um, centered around four questions um, shown here. We don't even know the shape of the heliosphere. This is one of the questions we're trying to answer. The other one is the fact that the heliosphere is embedded in a partially ionized interstellar medium, how it affects the characteristics of the wind. This has to do with this other component called hot pickup ions that enter and affect. So the solar wind that Sarah studied near, the, near Earth is modified heavily by the hydrogen atoms as the solar wind goes out. And we would like to understand all the very fundamental processes like reconnection, turbulence that affect it. Um, and we also have a question, how far we have to go away from the heliosphere to stop sensing the influence of the heliosphere. And we still don't know that. Um, and finally, the very critical question that, like I said, will affect astronauts is how radiation gets filtered and transported throughout the heliosphere. Um, so, oops, the other a very important component um, the heliosphere community is a older community. We are bringing um, newer generation to be trained and diversify the voices in the heliosphere community. But this is a problem in general in space physics and astronomy. You need more diverse voices to have new ideas and new ways of doing science. So we are trying to embed it within the, what the activities um, of the center and also um, have other broader impact activities to increase the diversity. So here are some of the um, activities we're pushing on that. Um, please reach out to us. This is an email shield outreach at bo.edu. The director of the broader impact is uh, Simon Boxner. She's here. And the deputy is Nick Ross also here. So you can ask questions if you want. Um, and we are going to have um, another activity we're going to start in the fall that are testimonials where we are asking people like yourself, if you have an interesting background that you had more challenges or a different story that you would like to tell, please reach out to us. We had this um, in, the, in the first years of, of SHIELD, we had a series of testimonials. You can go to our website, you will find them. Um, our next event, and it's going to be Shirley Moore talking about the eclipse and then Lika Guatacuta talking um, also about the eclipse. So it's September 22 and October 20th. This is a fall webinar series. And so here is a poster announcing. So um, please be tuned to that. Um, we also have an activity as that if you are a younger researcher listening, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We have a coffee chat run by Nick Ross in a monthly basis where I'm not allowed and anybody more senior is not allowed when you have a free safe space to talk about the challenges and successes and things that you would like to know as an early career scientist, we call it coffee chat. And you can find us on the web that we have on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, but um, also what we are starting now that if you're interested, you can subscribe to Friends of Shield subscribe at googlegroup.com. It's pretty long, this email, but you can find us in Google Group, Friends of Shield, and you will get um, newsletters announcing and news of what's happening in Shield. And I think Nick is going to put, um, Nick, do you have something that you're, I have a- uh, Yes, the, I'm yeah. sorry that the date on the slide uh, for Lika's talk didn't get changed. It's in November and I'm looking up the date now. I'll okay. Yeah. Yes, and put in the chat to the, this email to subscribe to get news from SHIELD. Yep, I um, did that already. Okay, great. So 
without ado, I'm passing the floor to Sarah to tell her trajectory. I'm going to stop sharing um, so you can share. All right, thank you. Let me go ahead and share. And here we go. Can you hear me okay and see everything? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So yeah, um, I was given some some questions and this is, uh, it seems the intention here is to talk about a personal journey. So that's in fact, exactly what I'm going to do. And this picture right on the front, some of you may recognize because it's one of the pictures on the punch trading cards. That's part of our outreach effort that Sherilyn Morrow will probably talk more about. Um, in that, however, it's uh, just shows the left part of the uh, picture, uh, which makes it look like I'm playing baseball, wearing a dress. But actually, this was taken at my PhD thesis defense party, and we'd made this giant pinata of the sun the previous day, and we, when we hoisted it up, it immediately started to sag and rip. And you can kind of see that here, I think. You can see my mouse. Um, so there was no time to put on a blindfold. Someone handed me a bat and said, swing. So I did. And that brings me to the title of this talk. So one of the preparatory questions that you asked was about my childhood. Um, and that reminded me of a recent experience. Uh, I was cleaning up a box of memories that my mother had handed off to me. And I found a preschool report card. I know, who knew that preschool has report cards, right? And this would have been when I was about three years old. So about the age in these pictures, which by the way, were taken by my father, who used to make these wonderful Christmas cards. I'm the one here on the left with the drum and my sister Jenny has the violin. And this is me again on the right with the drumstick. And I'm pretty sure the drumstick was my favorite part of the instrument. But one of the contents in this nursery school report card was, Sarah doesn't skip, she gallops. And so I thought, huh, maybe this is a metaphor for how I approach life. Something, you know, evident at an early age that I tend to plunge forward into exploration and discovery, right? So I kind of liked it, right? So then I mentioned this to my mother and she said, oh no, they, they meant that literally. Apparently, as part of PE, physical education at my preschool, they had the children skip from one side of the playground to the other. And I would sort of lurch my way across without any kind of synchronization. And so they were worried about my gait. And that's what the comment was. But anyway, oh, well. Here's another Christmas card of my father's from a year or so later. And I chose this one because Jenny and I look like we're having a very intense conversation. We're trying to figure something out. And another of your questions was about my first memories of science, which brought to mind a book that my mother gave me when I was pregnant with my first son. It was called The Scientist in the Crib, uh, What Early Learning Tells Us About the Mind. It's by Alison Gopnik and co-authors. It's a great book. And it has one of my favorite quotes, which is, it's not that children are little scientists, but that scientists are big children. And the idea is that there's an evolutionary imperative for children to be good inquisitors, explorers, to make sense of their environment, to solve problems. And this is an imperative that generally fades as one gets older, except for in an odd subset of the population who never stop constantly trying to figure stuff out and who are thus predisposed to be scientists. So I would say all of my memories, early memories are scientific at some level. And you also asked about my parents, and they definitely encouraged me in this sustaining the impulse for curiosity. My father was a math teacher, and he would make these elaborate treasure hunts uh, with rebuses and word and number games for clues. And my mother was a professor of philosophy at a local college, and she would bring home logic puzzles that we do at the dinner table. And that brings me to Star Trek, because the logic puzzles inevitably uh, were set in the Star Trek universe. Uh, Klingons always lie, Vulcans always tell the truth. And my brother and sister and I used to watch the original Star Trek episodes over and over again in syndication. They were on every single night or every week night, but we didn't watch them in color because we had a black and white TV. So the whole red shirt concept completely went over my head for years and years and years. I loved science fiction. Um, Ursula Le Guin, R.A. Lafferty was a particular favorite of mine, and of course, Isaac Asimov. When I was 11, my mother got a sabbatical in Cambridge, England, and we, all, and we lived there for a few months. We went to English schools, um, and I took physics for the first time, and I loved it. 
It was the fun part of math, I remember thinking. It was puzzle solving. And so I decided I wanted to be a physicist. And I asked my parents what kinds of physicists there were. So they listed a bunch, biophysicist, particle physicist. Pretty sure my mom tried to sneak in metaphysicist. But when they said astrophysicist, I knew I had a winner. It's the fun part of math and it's science fiction too. So not surprisingly, the first book I read on astronomy was Asimov's book on astronomy. It's a great book. It's a blast. And in general, my nonfiction reading was not textbooks, but books that my mother would have lying around like these ones, the books sort of at the intersection of math and physics and philosophy. My other passion in those teenage years was theater. My sister and I acted and directed uh, in summer Shakespeare plays. Uh, at first, it was just our family um, and friends, but eventually we got paid to do it as directors of a summer camp up at the college my mom taught at. And I also acted in various other plays and musicals in high school and college. Um, and in general, I guess I liked being dramatic. This down here in the bottom is a picture of me with my friends camping. Um, I think I'm the one, I'm the one in the middle. Uh, I think I'm wearing long johns under rainbow capri pants and a ski jacket with a scarf and mucklucks. Basically everything warm that I had in my tent. Um, and this one on the right is me on the way to a Cure concert. Um, and the intention was to stick out in a sea of people in black. So it got me a reputation and led to one of my dorm mates saying to me my freshman year, oh, Sarah, you're not a physics major. You're a drama major. And after that, many of my college friends used to refer to me that way. And it took me a while to understand why this bothered me. At the time, I'm sure I laugh, roll my eyes, but when you are the only woman in your math and physics classes and you're being told you don't belong there, it's, you know, it's another brick in the imposter syndrome wall that pretty much anybody who doesn't fit the mold is gonna build up. And there's, I'll have more on that in a little bit. But anyway, besides, despite my friends teasing me, I ended up majoring in physics and I got a job my senior year with Phil Scherer's group. And undoubtedly the best perk of that job was being the resident astronomer at the Wilcox Solar Observatory up in the hills behind Stanford. We lived in this cute little house attached to the observatory. And I lived there with my roommates. This is Trisha here in a standing in a kiddie pool full of goldfish that for some reason we set up outside the apartment. Uh, on the right is Connie with our observatory cat, Isaac, and I'm in the middle. And you can just make out maybe a cow in the background. And the cows up at this observatory were absolutely everywhere. They would come over here to this window on the building and lick the window in the morning because the ocean fog would condense on it and make it taste salty. And we'd see these gross streaks on the window every morning or sometimes the cows licking them. Uh, and this is another picture you might see of the cow in front of the observatory and the observatory car, which was another amazing perk. I got to drive on campus in all the parts labeled university vehicles only as an undergraduate. Um, I even drove in the Stanford quad one time. So the observatory over here itself, it's a pyramid, right? Which is why my roommates and I called ourselves the high priestesses of the temple of the sun. Yeah, drama major, I know. But I actually did science. I woke up with the sun. I would go up here to this dome and I would open it up and turn on the telescopes. Um, luckily there was morning fog a lot of the morning so I could sleep in a little bit, but it really was a wonderful hands-on experience. Um, it was my first exposure to solar physics and to space weather. Um, I would call the NOAA Space Weather uh, Center in Boulder every morning and report on the mean magnetic field of the sun. And I ended up doing my undergraduate honors thesis with Phil Scherer on solar physics. But even so, when I first went to see Boulder for grad school, I originally thought I would do cosmology, science fiction, right? Um, but and I'm apologizing to any cosmologists out there, but I took an observational cosmology class and it was so boring. I mean, this was the 90s. There wasn't much to see. But solar physics, in contrast, was astronomy with the zoom lens. There was so much data, too much data, and so much incredible beauty and complexity. And so I was hooked. In graduate school, I got a job working for Fran Bagnell. More on her in a moment. And I studied the sun's uh, solar corona 
and the global magnetic field. It was not smooth sailing. I had to take my comprehensive exams twice. I remember I had a panic attack in the test room the second time around. I got through it, barely. And somewhere in there was my first conference talk. Uh, this picture is kind of from that time. I got up on stage, and for the first time in my life, I was completely paralyzed by stage fright. I stood there frozen. I didn't say anything for, I don't know, it felt like an hour, but I'm sure it was only a few seconds or something. And I had this vision of this far side cartoon. What am I doing here? I can't play this thing. I'm a flutist for crying out loud. And then I remember I caught the eyes of one of the conference attendees. It was Lydia Van Drill Castellier. She was sitting in the front row. She just kind of smiled at me and nodded. You got this. And I carried on. But honestly, I almost gave up at that point. I was seriously considering leaving uh, the field, leaving, go, taking a master's and going, doing something completely different. But luckily, Fran Bagenal was supportive of me traveling. And I got very good at applying for travel grants. And my second year of grad school, I went to Creef, Scotland for a summer school, immediately followed by going to Hawaii to the Mauna Loa Solar Observatory for the total solar eclipse of 1991. And it was transformative because I met people at those meetings and others and other meetings that we became great friends. And I don't know, I can point out, here's Lindsay Fletcher here and here, Norma Crosby, of course, Lika Gohaka Kurta here and here. This is Shadia Habal. Uh, and of course, Fran Bagenal. And in general, connecting with women in the field was absolutely crucial. My fellow female grad students were people who were going through the same things that I was going through. And the more senior ones were role models and mentors. And Fran Bagenal especially uh, had or has a way of combining bluntness with idealism. And I began to understand that it wasn't in my head. The playing field was not level, but for me anyway, the way forward was to run or gallop up the hill. So in terms of maintaining that resolve, I can't emphasize enough how important it was to have the examples of people like Fran, the role models. Ellen Zweibel was another professor at CU. She was amazing, brilliant. I was honestly in awe of her. And we had this meeting of the women in the astrophysics department and it was the first women in science thing I think I ever went to because I think it was the first time that I'd been somewhere with critical mass. And Ellen was there and she talked about imposter syndrome and it was the first time I'd heard about it. She said that when she got her PhD, she thought, ha ha, I fooled them all. And I was stunned. If Ellen Zweibel had imposter syndrome, it was real. So I got my PhD and fooled them all. And this is me. Uh, right, right before the party where I hit the pinata with my parents. Now, of course, I've also had really essential, amazing male mentors in my life. And a, a very important one was BC Lowe, starting out when I was a grad student and when I was a postdoc at HAO. And he introduced me to the magnetic flux rope. It is the um, ubiquitous building block of coronal magnetism and solar physics and heliophysics, where the magnetic energy to drive solar eruptions can be stored. And he also suggested that I collaborate with Yu Hong Fan. And so another one of your questions was, what were the important decisions that I made that shaped my career? And I would say that collaborating with people like BC and Yu Hong was hugely important. Throughout my career, I developed a broad range of scientific experience because of this kind of collaboration. Because like my thesis was mostly observational, but by working with BC and Yu Hong as a postdoc and as an early career scientist, I could strengthen my theoretical side. And then I went back to observation because my interest had been kindled by what I'd learned about magnetic flux robes. And so I did a deep observational dive into coronal cavities which are one of the sun's marvelous clues to its magnetic field at the heart of solar coronal mass ejections. And another question that was asked, prep question you asked, was about aspects that differentiate my approach to science. I wasn't a drama major, but I still love the dramatic and creative arts. So I was beginning to realize that it was not an either or of doing science or art, and throughout my career, I've maintained my passion 
by bringing those two together. From writing my thesis acknowledgments in iambic temptrometer to following literary inspiration wherever I can find it. For example, uh, people would tell me that the cavity, this dark region here, this elliptical structure, was uninteresting because it was empty. And I think it was Kathy Reeves who suggested this picture of the invisible man as an analogy. And then I found this quote, no hand, just an empty sleeve. Then I thought, there's something odd in that. What the devil keeps that sleeve up and open if there's nothing in it? So the invisible force of magnetism confronts us in nearly everything we study in heliophysics. And recognizing and seeking out the signs of this force is exactly the kind of puzzle solving that I like the most. I became intrigued with the way magnetism crosses time and space from the solar dynamo in its interior to the coronal magnetic fields, to the solar wind, to the Earth's space environment, to the outer heliosphere, from space weather to space climate, from coronal mass ejections to the solar sunspot cycle. Which is why during my postdoc at NASA Goddard, I became involved with the whole multidisciplinary community campaigns, which sought to characterize the heliosphere at solar minimum when there isn't all that pesky solar activity to mess up the con connections. And we started with sun to solar wind and the whole sun month. And the next solar minimum, we did a study of the sun to solar wind to geospace, whole heliosphere interval. And then finally, in the most recent minimum, we extended to other planets, space environments, and atmospheres in the whole heliosphere and planetary interactions, or whoopee. And this was another key decision point in my career, I think. Collaboration took on a new dimension. I met people in other disciplines than solar physics, which brings up something I think is really important, which is being willing and able, empowered, to ask naive questions. It's an easy trap to fall into as an academic to say, oh, of course, when someone asks if you understand, both because it's scary to admit that you're, you're ignorant and because doing anything else often means you have to stop the person in the middle of what they're saying and make them go back, which can be intimidating, especially in your early career, but it's really important. And the thing is, when you're involved in cross-disciplinary interactions, like these whole campaigns, everyone's a grad student in each other's field. If you don't ask each other the naive questions, you end up talking at each other and getting nowhere. And the other picture I have here, I've included because the Macintosh archive of solar features spans five solar cycles, so it's relevant to solar cycle studies. But also, this is an example of the kind of science art mashup that I, I like. Um, what we're looking at in this image is a solar cycle of coronal holes, which are the red and the blue in this plot, um, showing the positive and negative polarity. And they're taken in a strip, which is vertical here, um, and stacked versus time. So we tried, we, so you stretch them all out and you basically get 11 years. But if you stretch them on out, they're very hard to interpret. They're hard to fit in a page even. And so we found that if we curved it, we could actually maintain the information. And you can see how there's these structures that are long lived that survive for many, many months. And in fact, years. Um, and you can see how they shift in response to differential rotation on the sun and other forces. And it looks like a dragon when you put it in like this. All right, so this is my basically my final slide. It hits on another answer to the question that was asked about important science decisions that shaped my career. And I'd say one of them was definitely when I became project scientist of NASA's punch mission. It's a mission to observe the young solar wind using a constellation of a coronagraph and three heliospheric imagers. Um, and being project scientist is, it's a complex job and it involves logical problem solving in developing mission science requirements and building analysis tools. Lots and lots of creative writing in communicating the mission science. It involves a lot of public outreach with lots of opportunities for dramatic expression. And of course, plenty of science collaboration and team building. 
And at our Punch Four meeting this summer, I finally got to do something I have been threatening to do for decades, which is to join in on a solar physics interpretive dance. So yeah, I like being project scientist. Uh, it's a role that I relish. And that's why I've been taking it on for other missions that I'm passionate about, um, include, including the proposed Solaris mission to the sun's poles and the CLARO and the COSMO coronal magnetic field projects. I think these represents two passions of mine where I feel like we can make huge progress by going to the sun's poles and observing it in a way that's never been done before and by observing directly the coronal magnetic field of the sun's atmosphere. So I'll leave you with a QR code to the latest marriage of art and science that I've been involved with. It's the video for the My Corona uh, video. So please feel free to scan. And I wanna make one last comment. Um, as a woman in science in the eighties and nineties, I was definitely in the minority. Um, and of course, even today, women are underrepresented in science and face all sorts of discrimination and injustices around the world. But as a white woman in the United States, I was part of the dominant culture, and my parents were both academics, which was a huge advantage. For people who are first-generation college students, especially for people who are racial minorities, the challenges that they're going to be facing, you know, they're going to share some of the characteristics that I've described, um, but the degree is much greater. And the final comment I want to make is that anyone can develop imposter syndrome, even a white male, um, if they somehow feel they don't fit the mold. So let's break the mold. <laughs> anyway, that's it, thanks. Great, Sarah, that is so cool. I actually, I want the name of that book that you said about scientists as a children that, that I want to read it, that is fantastic, yeah. I have my own questions. I'm going to ask you one question, but while I ask, I am going to suggest to the audience to just start raising their hands, putting the chat so we can pass to you guys. Um, Sarah, so I have one, one questions and one thing, a comment just before my question. I love your um, story about the drama and the visual arts. Uh, influencing so much just a general comment I remember entering to physics back in Brazil and it was all guys right and they're all like idealizing Feynman and equations and I'm thinking I like arts like there were mm -hmm. no enough role models I was like will I remember going home asking my dad that was an academic that's a big advantage like can I be a physicist if my mind is visual my mind doesn't think first in equations like how you know this you're already feeling impostor syndrome right there because uh, how physics was taught was completely just following the math that is super important but that was a driving but what if your mind is different mm -hmm. so i think bringing diverse voices not just we're talking about minorities racial background but also way of thinking and elevating it right and that you can go at the problem, not even just in a linear A to B to C. What if you go around and you settle in the right different angles? It's also valid. It's, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think there's two distinct issues here, right? One of them is um, if you're if you're in a group that's not part of what is classically been thought of as the scientific norm. Um, it's like, well, you're in a group that doesn't do the thing that is just decided as what is classically the scientific norm. Yeah. Um, that's one issue. And and then the other issue is just the full def whole definition of the scientific norm, which has been skewed because of a lack of, of diverse um, involvement. Yeah, and so you feel, and still today, still today, you have in, in different communities, but you, you still have this thought if you're not thinking in a certain way, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's not acceptable. And, and this is, you, we need to really break, break the, yeah. I had a quick question, then I'm going to pass to other people. Um, challenges, like, I know I had mine, just taking my own experience, when I had challenges in impostor syndrome, challenge, challenge in general, um, I had a way to overcome it. So I wonder if I had my support system, my childhood friends, I had my to-go people. In my case, I was an academic brat. It was my dad and my sister. I could call them up and say, 
I also wanted to leave. And they would say, get in, get in, get, you can do it. But so I, I am very aware for my own students that don't have it or in general. So I wanted to hear from you specific challenge that you had. How did you tell myself, like, I love it so much, I'm going to stay? Or you talk about fun, fun, and I love that, this this bluntness and idealism. That is, it's a great mixture, but I don't know if you've got other examples. Well, yeah, and I mentioned, you know, the time when I was about about to quit, really. And I remember yeah. I, I called my mom and I said, I think I'll quit. I think I'll just come home and, um, you know, maybe I'll teach. And she just sort of laughed. She goes like, yeah, you know, you don't just get a job <laughs> like that. And I, so I was like, oh yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And so I thought about it and I talked, it was, it was the combination of talking to people who are blunt and who said, yeah, well, what do you want to do? And is, are, if you're passionate, you stay, if you're not, um, then maybe you don't. But, um, I talked to people who gave me blunt advice and, and listened to me. And then I also found uh, a peer group that I could commiserate with and just know I wasn't alone. And I think that's how I got through the, those. The peer lives. on, on, Absolutely. and also this is another challenge we can talk later, how you find your mentors and how to find people. Um, let me not hog all the questions. Um, I think Gilly Gilbert, you have a question? Oh. Uh, Sure. I mean, mine's very similar. Um, like, did you have an experience specifically at any point that made you consider quitting and how did you overcome that? And I don't know if that's super unique from Rob's question. Yeah. And so I'm trying, uh, definitely there was the time in grad school and I felt like I was getting nowhere. Um, there's been other times when it's just been overwhelming. Um, and it's, it's, you have to, First of all, if you're overwhelmed, you need to take a break and stop and think about what's how you can do things differently, right? And so at different times in my career, I've I've had you know, Fran again, who's basically counseled me how to say no and not get overcommitted, which works up to a point and you know, you have to keep reinforcing that. Um, but also just there's the question of as you're a postdoc and you're you don't know if you're going to get a job and if you have the two body problem, which I did, where you have your spouse in the same or, or partner in the same field, these are real challenges, right? And people make choices all the time about whether or not to continue. Um, so I would say talk, getting the commiseration of your peers, but also having, you know, finding people, mentors, people who will tell you how they, you know, what they did. And also just knowing that you are not alone in having the sense of like, you shouldn't think that it, just because you, you had the moment when you were not we were like, ah, forget it, I'm out of here. That that means you're not meant to be in this field. That's not true. Everybody has those moments. And it's the willingness to keep going and keep um, doing it, which uh, ultimately persists because you get support from other people, I think. It's a whole big conversation about how to take care of your own mental health when yes. you're going through that mm -hmm. and which kind of tricks. This is a whole different tricks you do. I had to go back to remind myself, I love it so much. I'm not going to let whatever happening influencing decisions. But I don't know if you want to comment on that or- Well, actually, and that was something I kind of brought up that I think that what I do where I try to look in, and find the artist, artistic or the literary, or there's something that pulls it in, sometimes helps me kind of pull it back to my center. Because I think right. we all have our different strengths. And you know, the thing which may or may not be in line with what people classically talk about is the, uh, you know, the, the scientific approach. If it is wonderful, but also there are things that you do. I think the question was, what do you do kind of uniquely? And everybody's going to have a different answer of that. And so when you're feeling lost to say, well, can I make it more my own? Can I make it more connected to the way I want to do this and the things that really make me passionate? I know it helps me if I'm feeling- It's help center. Yeah, help me as well. It yeah. helps center, you know, right, I, I agree. Um, Jamie La Lanetos, I think I'm, I'm mentioning correct. You want to have a question? Um, you two were just talking about a second ago. Oh, was it someone else? Sorry. Well, hi, yeah, I I brought Jaime up too. Uh, can you can you unmute Jaime? Yeah, I just had a question on um, if you had switched to a different field. What what did you think on switching to? Well, I always 
I've always wanted to to write books. And so probably that would be that that's been something I've thought about. I've always thought about that. That's something I'll do when I retire as well. So um, it's just sort of a question of when. But honestly, that is part of why I persisted is that when I really thought about day to day, what kind of job could I get that would let me do things I love most of the day? <laughs> um, it was hard to come up with something else. So that's a that's right. part of how you stay on on track because you kind of think, yeah, actually, this is the right thing, even though it's really hard right now. Right, right. That's that's what. Yeah. And um, I noticed and there are I, questions in the chat too. Yeah, we are. You're seeing. Yeah, we are passing and. That is my prior student. I'm so happy to see you, Elena. <laughs> hi, Mirav, and hi, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Um, so I have a following question. So being a project scientist, uh, it seems to be very different from doing science like coding or doing simulations. How did you prepare yourself for this role? And how do you combine being a project scientist on a mission and also continue doing science? And thank you. Great question. Um, great questions. Um, with Planche, it kind of happened fast. And so I didn't have a lot of preparation for other times, for other ones like Solaris, I'd say Punch has been wonderful preparation. Um, I had a remarkably supportive, uh, I mean, I don't know, all the PIs are wonderful. I'm not going to try to, but Craig DeForest was amazing because Craig DeForest was so thoroughly um, into the science that he he had my back at every stage when I started out being a, pro, a project scientist. Um, and in terms of how did I continue doing, how do I try to continue doing science? It's through collaboration. And in particular with Punch, um, as you know, I've, I've, I, I really love collaborating with the early career scientists. We have the associate investigators at Punch. Um, and being able to work with them is wonderful because it both helps sort of make sure that that tie between these the early career scientists and punch is really strong even before we launch. And it allows me to see this amazing science and to support it. Um, so I would say mostly through collaboration. How do you make sure that they are heard, the early careers? We are struggling with that we shield. We're thinking lots of different things to bring in, but to be sure that, that they are heard, that they're really their needs are heard, not just scientifically, but emotionally too. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to do it is to listen, right? And I try, I'm not, I'm not perfect at it by any means, but to stop talking and just listen and hear what people are trying to say because, and to have provide a safe space for somebody to say what they need to say, um, whether it's about science, it's the same thing about being, I hope nobody, I hope everybody who works with me feels completely empowered to ask a question that might seem to them naive. I love those questions. I love those questions. Sometimes they're things I've never thought of because they come at it from a different angle. And if I can't explain it, then I don't understand it. So it kind of helps me understand where I need to learn more. Um, so just to be able to kind of provide a space where people can talk and I can listen. Yeah, yeah. Well, in my own group, yes, but we're thinking a broader when you have a big team to make sure other people. It's a great question. And, and maybe one that the early career scientists I, I'd love to hear what what you guys are coming up with because I think yeah we can talk more we are we are constantly it's a moving target we're trying to figure out good ways to get the channels to flow yeah um, and and I think there is another question from Leo Osius Leo you can unmute yourself thank you um, I'm wondering how to convince other people to not give up on you if you don't really have a good academic network. Um, assuming you can get to the point where you believe in yourself, you still have to convince other people. So do you have any suggestions for how to do that? Yeah, I think peer support can be huge there. Um, and of course, mentor support, but peer support. Um, I really didn't think of, I, I mean, I definitely had imposter syndrome for quite a long time. And it was actually, I got nominated for the Harvey Prize. I never would have thought of myself in that role. And it was a combination of a peer, it, I, I guess I can say Barbara Thompson, who got together with BC Lowe. And having the peer sort of trying to make peers helping each other succeed, I think is really important. And then the mentor really has to be able to recognize the strengths in the individual and promote them, let them grow, build that 
confidence because it doesn't come automatically for a lot of people. But um, Sarah, can I just um, ask, in certain in certain trajectories, I mentioned it earlier, and this might be what uh, Leo was asking. It's not, sometimes the mentors are right there and you end up, you, you're lucky. You found them in your environment, you recognize and, and you said, great. But sometimes you come from a different background or I don't know, and, and you come from a different field and it's hard for you to navigate and find the mentors. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and that is, a, it's, it's, I, I think it's a really tender spot. How do you reach out, out of your immediate surrounding to find that mentor that will advocate for you? Yeah. Um, that's a great question because a lot of it comes down to the luck and the, you know, there's, there's a pro self-propagating thing, right? Um, there are networks out there where somebody is there and then they, they're, it helps to have a more diverse field overall so that people find people, they feel comfortable kind of building that connection. It has to be also coming from the mentors looking for people who need that support, but it's, it's hard. And if you're an individual and you feel like you're not getting that support, how do you actually make it happen? Um, I, I don't have an easy answer to that other than, um, finding groups like Marib was talking about the coffee and just having safe places to say, this is my need. And maybe people have ideas. I've seen remarkable things with early career scientists helping each other. Um, as soon as just, so maybe just, maybe it's too hard to go and speak up to a mentor. I need you to be my mentor. Maybe you can speak up to a, a somebody up here, a grad student and say. No, although it's happened, I have seen it. And it's amazing. You, you reach out outside of your immediate and you just go to that person and say, I would like you to be my mentor. That That's also, it absolutely it's a very hard thing to do, but right. But maybe your peers can say, okay, have you tried talking to so-and-so? I think they would right. actually be really helpful. Right. Even if they're not in the in your community, exactly. if they're in a, in a neighboring community, but you think they will have a listening ear, I will suggest you talk to them. Right. Um, I don't want to hog anymore. Nick, Sunin, do you guys have another questions uh, that I didn't cover? Or another person that is listening to us want to ask a question to Sarah? I I have a a question about so do you now, and it sounds like maybe you do, do you actively seek out mentees now, now that you're like maybe maybe now that you're a project scientist for a major uh, NASA mission, you, you might've gotten over your, your, your imposter syndrome, maybe. Um, <laughs> or, but now do you, do you seek out, how, do you seek out mentees and how do you go about doing that? And what, uh, what do you, um, um, what do you look for? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, uh, I was the interim director at HAO, I mentioned earlier, or Marev mentioned, and it was a wonderful experience, but um, it wasn't what I necessarily wanted to continue doing. And one of the things when I got out of that side of management was, was I made a commitment that I was going to um, do that, to really reach out and try to find mentees. Um, and it's a lot of it is just people have come up and talked to me, um, reached out on email. We have various programs people apply to. And so I've been, you know, working through that punch, of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have to be realistic about how much I can do. And um, and that's something which I'm struggling with right now because so many amazing people and I want to work with everybody. But um, but yeah, it, it, it's not a passive thing. It is active. You you look for it and you raise your hand when they say, somebody want to do this and, and so on. And then you have to figure out the boundaries and how much is actually possible. Right. right. And you've touched on that, Sarah, this, I think as, um, you know, as a person that doesn't fit the mode, you get tasked to do more outreach or more, that is also hard. I, I had discussed that with Fran as well, managing your time and your mental health to be able to be, uh, you know, happy and a working scientist, et cetera. It's also a challenge. 
I had a sign up on my computer for a while, which said, um, it was like a little sticky note and said, say no to everything you can. <laughs> and, and the point being to prioritize, right? To say, look, right. and if you prioritize the mentoring arrangements, maybe that's not what you're saying no to, but there are other things. And right. you don't- You need to, you're limited on your, your own, yeah. You're yeah. on, right. And you have to make sure, and, and the beauty of the mentor mentee relationship is you can continue doing science, right? I mean, you're, you're teaching and you're also doing, and so it's kind it's of, it's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I love it. Um, any other question? We are almost reaching to the top of the hour. There's one more question. I see the hand rain. Oh, Sandlin, you want to unmute? Hi, Sarah. So nice to see you. I just want you to talk a little bit. I love your work-life balance and you're just really going along with this prioritization. And I just want you to give some advice to our younger scientists about that as they're kind of looking at making themselves and really prioritizing what's important. I was actually okay. thinking so, the same as she was talking. So Great I'm going to use, this is something which I attribute to Fran and she attributes to me. So I'm not sure it's shrouded in the mysteries of history or whatever, who actually said what to whom when. This is how I remember it. Um, when I was starting out and, you know, requests to do things got started getting overwhelming. Um, she was saying, well, you, and I was like, I have to say no more. And she says, well, you know, do you wait 24 hours? And I said, yeah, I do that. And I do. And I think that's the first thing. If you ever get asked to do something, wait 24 hours before you answer. Don't, you know, think it through, let yourself sleep on it. Um, but then I think it gets to the point where you also need positive reinforcement when you say no. Okay. And so the um, way I remember is that Fran said, Right. You know, if you say no, you need to do something, go home and have a gin and tonic, have your partner give you a kiss. And so after that, um, uh, we used to call it the GTK, gin and tonic and kiss. And so every time my <laughs> husband and I would say no, we'd say, I get a GTK. <laughs> so I, it's, you know, just to basically validate that your mental health is important and you don't, you can't do everything. Um, so sometimes you have to say no, and it can be really, really hard to do it but you have to, and you have to recognize that it's a good choice. It's not that you're letting the world down. They'll, and for, if you're getting these requests, they will keep coming. So if you say no, you know, and you do need to prioritize a little. When you're an early career person, you're getting an invited talk, that's probably something to prioritize, right? Um, so talk But I to think it's coming back to what you said about the mentors, having a group of mentors. I had it early on. I remember talking to um, Judith Lynn about the, mental health and work balance and having somebody that you respect tell you that this is important and give you advice like you had with fun is critical as well. And can I just uh, say, I really like Leo's image there. That's beautiful <laughs> on the icon there. So oh yeah. We're doing that. Yeah, there's darkness you can breathe light. Beautiful. Um, Folks, that was a super pleasure, immense pleasure. I love these webinars are informal venues when we can start talking about questions that usually we don't talk, right? Um, so um, the other thing I wanted to remind folks, we are still coming up with um, our spring uh, SHIELD webinar. If you have suggestions for speakers, we are getting some of them. So please feel free to send to me, to Sanley, to Nick to the shield outreach suggestions. And it doesn't have to be in the, you know, solar heliophysics. We got suggestions for planetary. We are trying to reach out to different communities of people that you would like to hear more uh, um, life trajectory. Last words, Sarah, before we finish. <laughs> oh, just, um, I feel really optimistic about our field in the last few years. I feel like there's been paradigm shifts in terms of the way we um, accept diversity of all sorts. And I think that the future looks good because of it. I agree. There has been like, I think an accelerated shift in recent years. I can see it in the body of students and, and in the community. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, okay, fantastic. I'm just looking at the chat that I didn't miss anybody. Great. Thank you so much, folks. Bye. So see you in the next webinar. Bye. Have a great 4th of July. 4th of July. Um, Labor Day weekend. Holiday. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Appreciate it.